Hello, I'm Arielle Kahn with the Future of Life Institute. As you may have seen, this month we announced a pledge against lethal autonomous weapons. The pledge calls upon governments and government leaders to create a future with strong international norms, regulations, and laws against lethal autonomous weapons. But in the meantime, signatories agree that they will neither participate in nor support the development, manufacture, trade, or use of lethal autonomous weapons. At the time of this recording, over 220 AI-related organizations and over 2,800 individuals have signed. Signatories include Google DeepMind and its founders, University College London, the XPRIZE Foundation, ClearPath Robotics, Silicon Valley Robotics, the European Association for Artificial Intelligence, and many other AI societies and organizations from around the world. Additionally, people who signed include Elon Musk, Google's head of research and machine learning, Jeff Dean, many prominent AI researchers such as Stuart Russell, Toby Walsh, Meredith Whitaker, Anka Dragan, Yashua Bengio, and even politicians like British MP Alex Sobel. But why? We've all seen the movies and read the books about AI gone wrong, and yet most of the signatories agree that the last thing they're worried about is malicious AI. No one thinks the Terminator is in our future. So why are so many people in the world of AI so worried about lethal autonomous weapons? The short answer is, it's complicated. For the longer answer, we have this podcast. For this podcast, I spoke with six of the leading experts in autonomous weapons. I spoke with defense expert Paul Charest, who recently released the book Army of None, Autonomous Weapons and the Future of War. We discussed the history of autonomous weapons and semi-autonomous weaponry, which dates back to World War II as well as some of the more nuanced issues today that often come up for debate. AI researcher Toby Walsh looks at lethal autonomous weapons from a more technical perspective, considering the impact of autonomous weapons on society, and also the negative effects they could have for AI researchers if AI technology is used to kill people. Richard Moyes, with Article 36, coined the phrase meaningful human control, which is what much of the law's debate at the United Nations now focuses on. He describes what that means and why it's important. Mary Wareham and Bonnie Doherty joined from Human Rights Watch, and they're also founders of the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. They talk about the humanitarian impact of lethal autonomous weapons, and they explain the process going on at the United Nations today as efforts move towards a ban. Finally, my interviews end with Peter Asaro with the International Committee for Robot Arms Control and also the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. Peter considers the issue of laws from an ethical and legal standpoint, looking at the impact killer robots could have on everything from human dignity to war crimes. But I'll let each of them introduce themselves better when their interviews begin. And because this podcast is so long, in the description we've included the times that each interview starts, so that you can more easily jump around or listen to sections as you have time. One quick final point to mention is that everyone was kind enough to join at the last minute which means not all of the audio is perfect. Most of it is fine, but please bear with us if you can hear people chattering in the background or any other similar imperfections. And now for the first interview with Paul Shari. I'm Paul Shari. I'm a senior fellow and director of the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for New American Security. We're a Washington, D.C.-based national security think tank that's an independent bipartisan research organization. And you have a background in weaponry. You were in the military, correct? Yeah. So I uh, served about five and a half years in the U.S. Army as a ranger and a civil affairs team leader. And I did multiple tours to Iraq and Afghanistan. And then I worked for several years after that in the Pentagon, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, where I actually worked on policy issues for emerging weapons technologies, including autonomous weapons. Okay. And so one of the very first questions that I want to start with is, how do you define an autonomous weapon? Uh, I mean, that's sort of the million dollar question in a lot of ways. And I don't want to imply that all of the debate around autonomous weapons is a misunderstanding of semantics. That's not true at all. There are clearly people who have very different views on what to do about the technology. But it is a big complicating factor because I have certainly seen, especially at the United Nations, very heated disagreements where it's clear that people are just talking past each other in terms of what they're envisioning. When you say the term autonomous weapon, it conjures all sorts of different ideas in people's minds. 
some people envisioning super advanced, intelligent machines that have human-like or superhuman intelligence, something like a Terminator or Cylon from science fiction. And other people are envisioning something that might be very simple and doable today, like a, a Roomba with a gun on it. And both of those things are probably really bad ideas, but for very different kinds of reasons. And I think that that's a complicating factor. So one of the dimensions of autonomy that people tend to get fixated on is how smart the weapon system is. I actually don't think that that's a useful way to define an autonomous weapon. Sometimes I'll hear people say things like, well, you know, this is not an autonomous weapon, it's an automated weapon because of the level of sophistication. And I don't think that's very helpful. I think it's much better actually to focus on the functions that the weapon is performing on its own. This is similar to the approach that the International Committee of the Red Cross has, which focuses on critical functions in weapon systems. The way that I define it in my book is I basically define an autonomous weapon as one that can complete an entire engagement cycle on its own. That is to say, it has all of the functionality needed to search for targets, to identify them, to make a decision about whether or not to attack them, and then to start the engagement and carry through the engagement all by itself. So there's no human in this loop, this cognitive loop of sensing and deciding and acting out on the battlefield all by itself. That defines it in such a way that there are some things, and this is what gets into some of the tricky definitional issues. There are weapons that have been around since World War II that I would call semi-autonomous weapons that have some degree of autonomy. They have some sensors on board. They can detect the enemy and they can make some rudimentary kinds of actions like maneuvering towards the enemy. Militaries generally call these homing munitions. They're torpedoes or air-to-air missiles or surface-to-air, air-to-ground missiles. And they have sensors on them that might use sonar or radar or acoustic signatures. And they can sense that the enemy is there. And then they use those sensors to maneuver towards the enemy to strike the target. These are generally launched by people at targets where the human knows there's a target there. These were originally invented in World War II by the Germans to hit Allied ships in uh, the submarine wars in the Atlantic in World War II. And you can imagine there's a technical challenge of trying to hit a moving target of a ship. It's moving in a submarine, you're trying to fire a torpedo at it, and you might miss. And so the first versions of these had microphones that could listen to the sound of the propellers from Allied ships and then steer towards where the sound was greatest so they could hit the ship. And so in those cases, and this is still the case in those that are used today humans see the target or have some indication of the target, maybe from a radar or sonar signature. And humans say, there's something out there. I want to launch this weapon to go attack it. And those have been around for 70 years or so. And I bring that up because there are some people who sometimes say, well, look, these autonomous weapons already exist. This is all a bunch of hullabaloo about nothing. I don't think that's really true. I think that a lot of the weapon systems that you see concern about going forward would be things that would be quite qualitatively different, things that are going out over a wide area and searching for targets on their own, where humans don't necessarily know where the enemy is. They might have some suspicion that the enemy might be in this area at this point in time, but they don't know, and they launch the weapon to then find the enemy And then without radioing back to a human for approval, that weapon is delegated the authority to attack on its own. By and large, we don't see weapons like this in existence today. There are some exceptions. The Israeli Harpy drone or loitering munition is an exception. There were a couple experimental U.S. systems in the 80s and 90s that that are no longer in service. But this isn't something that's in widespread use. And so I do think the debate about where are we going in the future is at least a very valid one. And we are on the cusp of potentially things that would be quite different than anything we've seen before in warfare. So I want to um, ask a quick question about the harpy and any other type of weapon similar to that. Have those actually been used to kill anyone yet to actually identify, target and kill some enemy? Or are they still just being used for identifying and potentially targeting people? but it's still a human who is making the final decision? It's a great question. To the best of my knowledge, the Israeli harpy has not been used in its fully autonomous mode in combat. And so a couple of things about how the harpy functions. First of all, it doesn't target people per se. It targets radars. Now, having said that, if a person is standing next to a radar that it targets, you know, you're probably going to be killed. But it's not, it's not looking for individual persons. 
It's looking for radar signatures and then zeroing in on them. I mention that as important for two reasons. One, sometimes in some of the concerns that people raise about autonomous weapons, it can sometimes be unclear, at least to like a listener, whether they are concerned about uh, specifically weapons that would target humans or any weapon that might target you know, where anything on the battlefield. And so that's, I think, one consideration. But also from sort of a um, practicality standpoint, it is easier to identify radio signatures more accurately than people who, of course, in many modern conflicts are not wearing uniforms or insignia or other things that might clearly identify them as a combatant. And so a lot of the issues around distinction and accurately discriminating between combatants and non-combatants are harder for weapons that would target people. But the answer to the question is a little bit tricky because there was an incident a couple of years ago where a second generation version of the Harpy called the Harup or Harpy 2 was used in the Nagorno-Karabakh region in the conflict there between Azerbaijan and Armenia. I think it was used by Azerbaijan and used to attack what looked like a, I believe it was a bus full of fighters. Now, by all accounts, the incident was one of actual militants being targeted, combatants, not civilians. But here was a case that was clearly not a radar. It was a bus that would not have been emitting radar signatures. Based on my understanding of how the technology works, the Hera, the Harpy 2, has a human in the loop mode. So the first generation Harpy, as far as I understand, is all autonomous. The second generation version definitely has a human in the loop mode. It looks like it's not clear whether it also has an autonomous version. In writing the book, I reached out to the manufacturer for more details on this, and they were not particularly forthcoming. But in that instance, it looks like it was probably directed by a human, that attack, because as far as we know, the weapon does not have the ability to autonomously target something like a bus. Okay. It's a really long-winded answer. And this is what actually makes these issues super hard sometimes, because they depend a lot on the technical specifications of the weapon, which A, are complicated, and B, are like not always very transparent. I mean, companies are not always very transparent publicly about how their weapon systems function. And one can understand why that is, right? They don't want uh, adversaries to come up with methods of fooling them and countermeasures. On the other hand, for people who are interested in understanding how companies are pushing the bounds of autonomy, that can be very frustrating. One of the things that I really like about the way you think is that it is very nuanced and takes into account a lot of these different issues. And I think it's tempting and easy and I don't want to make it sound like I'm being lazy because I, I personally support banning lethal autonomous weapons, but I think it's a really complicated issue. And so I was, I'd like to know more about what are your thoughts on a ban? So there are two areas on this topic that I think was where it gets really complicated and really tricky. So if you start with a broad principle that someone might have of something like humans should be making decisions about lethal force or you know only humans should be deciding to take human life. There's two areas where you try to figure out how do I put that into practice, and then you really run into some serious challenges. And I'm not saying that it makes it impossible, but it becomes difficult. You have to sort of really roll up your sleeves and get into some of the details of the issue. So one is, how do you translate a broad concept like that into technical specifications of a weapon? So if you start with an idea and say, well, only humans should be responsible for taking human life, that seems like a reasonable idea, Okay. How do you translate that into technical guidance that you give weapons developers over what they can and cannot build? That's actually really hard. And I say that as having done this when I worked at the Pentagon, and we tried to write guidance that was really designed to be internal to the U.S. Defense Department to give guidance to defense companies and to military researchers on what they could build. And it was hard to translate some of these abstract concepts, like humans should decide the targets, to technical ideas. Well, what does that mean for how long the weapon can load or over a target area, or how big its sensor field should be, or how long it can search for? And some of those, you have to try to figure out how to put those technical characteristics into practice. Let me give you two examples of a weapon, and this illustrate kind of how this can be challenging. You might imagine a weapon today where a human says, ah, here's an enemy target, and I want to take that target out. And I launch a missile, and the missile flies towards the target. Let's say it's a tank. And the missile uses a millimeter wave seeker on the tank. It's an active seeker, sends out millimeter wave radar signatures to see the tank and illustrate it and sort of highlight it from the background and then zero in on the tank because the tank's moving and they need to have this sensor to hit the moving tank. If 
the weapon and the sensor can only search for a very limited space in time and geography, then you've constrained the autonomy enough that the human is still in control of what it's targeting. But as you start to open that aperture up, and maybe it's no longer that it's searching for one minute in a one kilometer area, it's now searching for eight hours over a thousand kilometers. Now you have a completely different kind of weapon system, right? Now it's one that's much more like, I make the analogy in the book of the difference between a police dog that might be set loose to go chase down a suspect, where the human says, there's the suspect, dog, go get him, versus a mad dog roaming the streets, attacking anyone at will. You have two different paradigms, but where do you draw the line in between? And where do you say, well, you know, is one minute of loiter time? Is it two minutes? Is it 10 minutes? Is it 20 minutes? What's the geographic area? That's going to depend a lot on the target, the environment, what kind of clutters in the environment, what might be an appropriate answer for tanks in an urban combat setting might be very different than naval ships on the high seas or submarines underwater or, or some other target in a different environment. So that's one challenge. And then the other challenge, of course, which is, is even more contested, is just sort of what's the feasibility of a ban and getting countries to come together to actually agree to things? Because ultimately, countries have militaries because they don't trust each other. <laughs> They don't trust international law to constrain other countries from aggressive action. So regardless of whether you, you favor one country or another, you consider yourself an American or a Russian or a Chinese or a French or Israeli or a Ghanaian or someone else, countries in general, they have militaries because they don't trust others. And that makes, even if you get countries to sign up to a ban, that's a major challenge in getting people to actually adhere to them. Because there are always countries are always fearful about others breaking these rules and cheating and getting the upper hand. I mean, we have had other bans. I mean, we've banned biological weapons, chemical weapons, landmines, space weapons. Do you see this as different somehow? Yeah. So one of the things that goes through in my book is as comprehensive as I could come up with a list of all of the attempts to regulate and control emerging technologies dating back to antiquity, dating back to ancient Indian prohibitions in Hindu laws of Manu or the Mahabharata on poisoned and barbed arrows and fire tip weapons. And it's really a mixed bag. I like to say that there's sort of enough examples of both successes and failures for people to kind of pick whichever examples they want for whatever side they're arguing for, because there are many examples of successful bans, and I would say largely successful, right? There are some examples of isolated instances of people not adhering to them. Very few bans are universally adhered to. We certainly have Bashar al-Assad using chemical weapons in Syria today. But bans that have been largely successful and that they've at least had a major effect in reducing these weapons include landmines, cluster munitions, blinding lasers, biological weapons, chemical weapons, using the environment as a weapon, placing nuclear weapons on the seabed or in orbit, placing any weapons of any kind on the moon or in Antarctica, various regulations during the Cold War anti-ballistic missile systems, intermediate-range nuclear ground-launch missiles, and then, of course, regulations on the number of nuclear weapons. So there are, there are a lot of successful examples. Now, on the other side of the coin, there are failed attempts to ban, famously, of course, the crossbow, and that's, that's often brought up in these conversations. But in more recent memory, attempts at the 20th century to ban and regulate aircraft and air-delivered weapons submarine warfare, of course, the failure of attempts to ban poison gas in World War I. So there are examples on other sides of the ledger as well. One of the things that I try to do in my book is get beyond sort of just picking examples that people like and say, well, is there a pattern here? Are there some common conditions that make certain bans more likely to succeed or fail? I mean, there's been great scholarship done by some others before me that I uh, was able to build on, Rebecca Krutoff and Sean Welsh, that have done work on this, trying to identify some common patterns. And I think that that's a, if you want to look at this analytically, that's a fruitful place to start, is to say, why does some ban succeed and some fail? And then when you're looking at any new technology, whether it's autonomous weapons or something else, where do they kind of fall on the spectrum? And what does that suggest about the feasibility of certain attempts at regulation versus others? And so can you expand on that a little bit? I mean, what have you found in, or, or what have, have they found in terms of patterns for success versus failure for a ban? So I think there's a couple of criteria that seem to matter. One is the clarity of a ban is really crucial. Everyone needs to have a clear agreement on what is in and what is out. 
And the simpler and clearer the definition is, the better. And in some cases, this principle is actually baked into the way that certain treaties are written. And I think the ban on cluster munitions is a great example of this, where the Cluster Munition Convention has a very, very simple principle in the treaty. It says cluster munitions are banned, full stop. Now, if you go into the definition, now there's all sorts of nuance about what constitutes a cluster munition or not. And that's where they get into some of the horse trading with countries ahead of time. But sort of the principle is no cluster munitions. The archetype of this importance of clarity comes in the success of restraint among European powers in using chemical weapons against each other on World War II. All sides had them. They didn't use them on the battlefield against each other. Of course, Germany used them in the Holocaust. And there were some other isolated instances in World War II of use against others who didn't have them. But the European powers all had tens of thousands of tons of mustard gas stockpile. And then you use them against each other. At the outset of World War II, there were also attempts to restrain aerial bombing of cities. It was widely viewed as reprehensible. It was also illegal under international law at the time. And there were attempts on all sides to refrain from that. And at the outset of the war, in fact, they did. And Hitler actually put a directive to the Luftwaffe. And I talk about this a little bit in the book, although unfortunately, a lot of the detail on some of this stuff got cut for space, which I was disappointed by. Hitler put a directive to the Luftwaffe saying that they were not to engage in bombing of civilian targets, a terror bombing in Britain. They were only engaged in bombing military targets, not because it was a humanitarian, because it was concerned about Britain retaliating. And this attempt at restraint failed when, in the middle of the night, a German bomber strode off course and bombed central London by mistake. And in retaliation, Churchill ordered the bombing of Berlin, and Hitler was incensed, gave a speech the following day, announcing the launch of the London Blitz. And so here's an example where there was some, some slippage in the principle of what was allowed and what was not. And so you had some, some a little bit of accidental crossing of the line in conflict. And so you know, the sharper and clearer this line is, the better. I think it's likely, you can extrapolate that and say it's likely that if, for example, what World War II powers had agreed to in World War II was that they could only use poison gas against military targets, but not against civilian targets, that it would have quickly escalated to civilian targets as well. And in the context of autonomous weapons, that's one of the arguments why you've seen um, some advocates of a ban say that they don't support what is sometimes called a partition treaty, which is something that would create a geographic partition that would say, you know, you could only use autonomous weapons outside of populated areas. And what some advocates of of a ban have said is, look, that's never going to, that's never going to hold in combat. That sounds good. I've heard some, some international humanitarian lawyers say that. Oh, well, this is how we solve this problem. But in practice, I agree that that's not likely to be very feasible. So clarity is important. Another factor is the relative value of the military value of a weapon versus its perceived horribleness. And I think, again, a, a good case in point here is the difference in the international community's success in largely getting most countries to give up chemical weapons, but the lack of success on nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, by any reasonable measure, are far more terrible in terms of their immediate and long-lasting effects on human life and the environment, but they have much more military value, or at least perceived military value. And so countries are much more reluctant to give them up. So that's another factor. And then there are some other ones that I think are, are fairly straightforward, but also matter things like the access to the weapon and the number of actors that are needed to get agreement. If only two countries have the technology it's easier to get them on board than if it's widely available and sort of everyone needs to agree. But I think those are some really important factors that are significant. One of the things I think that actually doesn't matter that much is the legality of a weapons treaty. I'm not saying it doesn't matter at all, but you see plenty of examples of legally binding treaties that are violated in wartime. And you see some examples, not a ton, but some examples of mutual restraint among countries when there is no legally binding agreement, or sometimes no agreement at all, no written agreement, it's sort of a tacit agreement to refrain from certain types of competition or uses of weapons. And so all of those, I think, are really important factors when you think about the likelihood of a ban actually succeeding on any weapons, not just time weapons, any weapons, but the likelihood of a ban actually succeeding in wartime. I'm probably going to want to come back to this, but you mentioned something that reminded me of another question that I had for you. And that is, in your book, you mentioned Oh, I don't remember what the weapon was, but it was essentially an autonomous weapon that the military chose not to use and ended up giving up because it was so costly and ultimately they didn't trust it to make the right decisions. 
And I, I'm interested in this idea of the extent to which we trust the weapons to do whatever it is that they're tasked with, if they're in some sort of autonomous mode. And I guess where we stand today with various weapons and whether militaries will have increasing trust in their weapons in the future. The case that I think you're referring to was an anti-ship missile called the Tomahawk anti-ship missile or TASM that was in service by the U.S. Navy in the 1980s. And it was what I would classify it as an autonomous weapon. It was designed to go over the horizon to attack Soviet ships. And it could fly a search pattern. And I think actually in the book, I include the graphic of the search pattern that it would fly to look for Soviet ships. So the concern was that the way this would work in, in anti-ship or anti-surface warfare is the Navy would send out patrol aircraft because they have, they're much faster, they have much longer range than ships, and they would scout for other enemy ships. The principle in a wartime environment is patrol aircraft would find a Soviet ship and then radio back to a destroyer the Soviet ship's location, and the destroyer would launch a missile. Now, the problem was by the time the missile got there, the ship would have moved. So the ship would now have what the military would call an area of uncertainty that the ship might be in. They wouldn't have the ability to continuously track the ship. And so what they basically would do is the missile would fly a search pattern over this area of uncertainty. And when it found the ship, it would attack it. Now, at the time in the 1980s, the technology was not particularly advanced and it wasn't very good at discriminating between different kinds of ships. And so one of the concerns was that if there happened to be another kind of ship in the area that was not an enemy combatant, it still might attack it if it was within this search pattern area. And again, it's originally cued by a human having some indication of something there. But there was enough uncertainty that it flies this pattern on its own. And I, I would, for that reason, call it autonomous weapon because there was a great amount of uncertainty about sort of what it might hit and whether it might do so accurately. And it could, once launched, it would sort of find and then attack all on its own. And so it was never used, and there was great hesitance about it being used. And I interview a retired uh, U.S. Navy officer who was familiar with it at the time. And he talks about sort of that they just didn't, they didn't trust that its targeting was good enough that once they let it loose, that it might hit the right target. And moreover, there was this, the secondary problem, which is it might hit the wrong target, sort of a, a false positive, if you will, but it also might miss the Soviet ship, in which case they would have simply wasted a weapon system. And that's another problem that militaries have, which is, you know, missiles are costly. They don't have very many of them in their inventory, particularly if it's something like a ship or an aircraft. There's only so many that they can carry physically on board. And so they don't want to waste them for no good reason, which is another practical sort of operational consideration. So eventually it was taken out of service for all of these, for what I understand to be all of these reasons. And that's a little bit of guesswork, I should say, as to why it was taken out of service. I don't have any official documentation saying that, but that's at least, I think, a reasonable assumption about some of the motivating factors based on talking to people who are familiar with it at the time. One of the things that I think is, is an important dynamic that I talk about in the book, which is that that is really an acute problem, the wasting the weapon problem for missiles that are not recoverable. You launch it, you're not going to get it back. If the, if the enemy's not there, then you've just wasted this thing. That changes dramatically if you have a drone that can return back. Now, all of the concerns about it hitting the wrong target and civilian casualties, those still exist. And those are very much on the minds of at least um, Western military professionals who are concerned about civilian casualties and countries that care about the rule of law more broadly. But it's this issue of wasting the weapon is less of an issue when you have something that's recoverable and you can send it out on patrol. And so I think it's possible, and this is a hypothesis, but I think it's possible that as we see more drones and combat drones in particular being put into service and being intended to be used in contested areas where they may have jammed communications, that we start to see that dynamic change. To your question about trust, I guess I'd say that there is a lot of concern, at least among the military professionals that I talk to in the United States and in other allied countries. NATO countries or Australia or, or Japan, that there is a lot of concern about trust in these systems. And in fact, I see much more confidence. I'm going to make a broad generalization here. Okay. So forgive me, but I, in general, I would say that I see much more confidence in the technology coming from the engineers who are building them at military research labs or at defense companies than in the military professionals in uniform who have to push the button and use them. That they're a little bit more skeptical of wanting to actually trust these and delegate that. They're, what they see is their responsibility to this machine. What do you envision, sort of if we go down current trajectories, as the future of weaponry, specifically as it relates to autonomous weaponry and potentially lethal autonomous weaponry? 
And to what extent do you think that international agreements could change that trajectory? And maybe even to what extent do you think countries might possibly even appreciate having guidelines to work within? I'll answer that. Let me first make an observation about most of the dialogue in this space. There's sort of two different questions wrapped up in there. What is the likely outcome of a future of autonomous weapons? Is it a good future or a bad future? And then another one is, what is the feasibility of some kind of international attempts to control or regulate or limit these weapons? Is that possible or unlikely to succeed? And what I tend to hear is that people on all sides of this issue tend to cluster into two camps. They tend to either say, look, autonomous weapons are horrible and they're going to cause all these terrible effects, but if we just all get together, we can ban them. And all we need to do is just, I don't know what's wrong with countries, we need to sit down and just sign a treaty and we'll get rid of these things and the problems will be solved. Other people in the opposite camp say, bans don't work. And anyways, autonomous weapons would be great. Wouldn't they be wonderful? They could make war so great and humans wouldn't make mistakes anymore and no innocent people would be killed and war would be safe and humane and pristine. And those, those, those things don't necessarily go together, right? So it's entirely possible. Like if you look at sort of imagine like a two by two matrix, like it's really convenient that everybody's views fit into those boxes very harmoniously, but it, but it's might, it may not be possible. I suspect that on the whole, autonomous weapons that have no human control over targeting are not likely to make war better. It's hard for me to see how that would be a better thing. I can see why militaries might want them in some instances. I think some of the claims about their military values might be overblown, but there are certainly some situations where you can imagine they'd be valuable. I think it's kind of remains to be seen how valuable in what context, but you can imagine that. But in general, I think that humans add a lot of value to making decisions about lethal force, and we should be very hesitant to take humans away. I also am somewhat skeptical of the feasibility of actually achieving restraint on these topics. I think it's very unlikely the way the current international dynamics are unfolding, which is largely focused on humanitarian concerns and berating countries and telling them that they are not going to build weapons that comply with international humanitarian law. I just don't think that's a winning argument. I don't think that resonates with most of the major military powers. So I think that when you look at actually historical attempts to ban weapons, that right now what we're seeing is a continuation of the most recent historical playbook, which is that elements of civil society have kind of put pressure on countries to ban certain weapons for humanitarian reasons. I think it's actually unusual when you look at the broader historical arc. Most attempts to ban weapons were driven by great powers and not by outsiders, and most of them centered on strategic concerns, concerns about someone getting an unfair military advantage or weapons, you know, sort of making war more challenging for militaries themselves, or making life more challenging for combatants themselves. When you say that it was driven by powers, do you mean you'd have, say, two powerful countries and one, they're each worried that the other will, will get an advantage, and so they agreed to just ban something in advance to avoid that? Yeah, so there's a couple like time periods that kind of seem most relevant here. So one would be a flurry of attempts to control weapons that came out of the Industrial Revolution around the dawn of the 20th century. These included air balloons, or basically air-delivered weapons from balloons or airplanes, submarines, poison gas, what was called fulminating projectiles. You could think of like projectiles or bullets that have fire in them or burning, exploding bullets, sawback bayonets. There was at least, they were, there was some restraint on their use uh, to some type of bayonet in World War I, although it wasn't ever written down, um, but there seems to be a historical record of some constraint, some restraint there. That was one time period. And at the time, that was all driven by the great powers at the time. So these were generally driven by the major European powers and then Japan, as Japan sort of came rising on the international stage and particularly was involved as a naval power in some of these naval, the naval treaties. And the Washington Naval Treaty is another example of this, attempts to control a naval arms race. And then, of course, there were a flurry of arms control treaties during the Cold War driven by the U.S. and the USSR. Many of them were somewhat bilateral. Many of them were multilateral, but driven principally by those two powers. So that's not to say there's anything wrong with the current models of NGOs and civil society pushing for bans because it's worked and it's worked in landmines and cluster munitions. I'm not sure that the same conditions apply in this instance, in large part because in those cases, there was real humanitarian harm that was demonstrated. And so you could actually, you could really, I mean, I think fairly criticize countries for not taking action because people were being, I mean, literally maimed and killed every day by lands of mines and cluster nations. 
Whereas here, it's more hypothetical. And so you see people sort of extrapolating to all sorts of possible futures. And some people saying, well, this is going to be terrible. But other people saying, oh, would it be great? And some people would be wonderful. And I'm just not sure that the, the current playbook that some people are using, which is to sort of generate public pressure, will work when the weapons are still hypothetical. And frankly, this is not like science fiction. Like there was, a, you know, this recent open letter that FLI was involved in. And I was sitting in the break room at CNN before doing a short bit on this and talking to someone about this. And they said, well, what are you going on about? And I said, well, you know, some AI scientists wrote a letter saying they weren't going to build killer robots. And it just, I think to many people, it just doesn't sound like a near-term problem. And that's not to say that it's not a good thing that people are leading into the issue. I think it's great that we're seeing people pay attention to the issue and anticipate it and not wait till it like happens. But I'm also just not sure that the public sentiment to put pressure on countries will manifest. Maybe it will. It's hard to say, but I, I don't think we've seen it yet. So do you think in terms of considering this to be more near term or farther away, are military personnel also in that camp of thinking that it's still farther away or within militaries, is it considered a more feasible technology in the near term? I think it depends a little bit on how someone defines the problem. If they define it as, hum- as an atomic weapon as human level intelligence, then I think there's a wide agreement. Well, at least within military circles, I can't say wide agreement. There's probably a lot of people on the podcast who might maybe the varying degrees of where they think where that might be in terms of listeners. But in the military circles, I think there's a perception that that's just not a problem in the near term at all. If what you mean is something that is relatively simple, but can go over a wide area and identify targets and attack them, I think many military professionals would say that the technology is very doable today. And have you seen militaries striving to create that type of weaponry? Like, are we moving in that direction? Or do you see this as something that militaries are still hesitating to move towards? Yeah, that's a tricky question. I'll give you my best shot at, at, at understanding the answer to that, because I think it's a really important one. And part of it is I just don't know, because there's not great transparency in what a lot of countries are doing. I have a like, fairly reasonable understanding of what's going on in the United States, but much less so in other places. And certainly in countries like authoritarian regimes like Russia and China, it's very hard to kind of glean from the outside what they're doing or how they're thinking about some of these issues. I'd say that almost all major military powers are racing forward to invest in more robotics and autonomy and artificial intelligence. I think for many of them, they have not yet made a decision whether they will cross the line to weapons that actually choose their own targets to what I would call an autonomous weapon. I think for a lot of Western countries, they would agree that there's a meaningful line there. They might parse it in different ways. The only two countries that have really put any public guidance out on this are the United States and the United Kingdom, and they actually define time up in quite different ways. And so it's not clear from that to interpret sort of how they will treat that going forward. U.S. defense leaders have said publicly on numerous occasions that their intention is to keep a human in the loop. But then they also often caveat that and say, well, look, if other countries don't, we might be forced to follow suit. So it's sort of like in the loop for now, but it's not clear how long for now might be. I think it's not clear to me whether countries like Russia and China even see the issue in the same light, whether they even see a line in the same place. And at least some of the public statements out of Russia, for example, talking about fully roboticized units for some Russian defense contractors claiming to have built autonomous weapons that could do targeting on their own. You know, suggest that they may just, they may not even see the light in the same way. And that's, in fairness, that is a view that I hear among some military professionals and technologists. I don't want to say this is a majority view, but it is at least a significant viewpoint where people will say, look, there's no difference between that weapon, an autonomous weapon that can choose its own targets, and a missile today. It's the same thing. And we're already there. Again, I don't totally agree, but that is a viewpoint that's out there. And so do you think that the fact that countries have these differing viewpoints? is a good reason to put more international pressure on developing some sort of regulations to try to bring countries in line, bring everyone onto the same page? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge supporter of the um, the process that's been going on at the United Nations. I'm frustrated, as many are, about the slowness of the progress. Part of this is a function of diplomacy, but part of this is just that they haven't been meeting very often. When you add up all of the times over the last five years, it's like maybe five or six weeks of meetings. This is not very much time that's been together. And part of it is, of course, let's be honest, it's deliberate obstinacy on the part of many nations who who want to slow world of progress of talks. But I do think it would be beneficial if countries could come to some sort of agreement about rules of the road, about what they would see as appropriate in terms of where to go forward. 
my view is that we've gotten the whole conversation off on the wrong foot by focusing on this question of whether or not to have a legally binding treaty, whether or not to have a ban. That's not how, if I, first to me, it's not how I would have framed the discussion from the get-go. Because what happens is, is that many countries dig in their heels because they don't want to sign up to a treaty. And so they're just like, they start from the position of, I'm opposed. They don't even know what they're opposed to. They're just opposed because they don't want to sign a ban. I think a better conversation to have would be to say, let's talk about the role of autonomy and machines and humans in lethal decision making in war going forward. And let's talk about the technology. Let's talk about what it can do, what it can't do. Let's talk about what humans are good at and what they're not good at. And let's think about the role that we want humans to play in these kinds of decisions on the battlefield. Let's come up with sort of a view of what we think right looks like. And then we can figure out what kind of piece of paper we write it down on, whether it's a piece of paper that's legally binding or not. Talking about what the technology actually is and what it can do is incredibly important. And in my next interview with Toby Walsh, we try to do just that. I'm Toby Walsh. I'm a scientific professor of artificial intelligence at the University of New South Wales, which is in Sydney, Australia. I'm a bit of an accidental activist in the sense that I've been drawn in as a responsible scientist to the conversation about the challenges, the opportunities, the risks that artificial intelligence pose in fighting war. And there's, there's many good things that AI is going to do in terms of reducing casualties and saving lives. But, but equally, I'm very concerned, like many of my colleagues are, about the risks that it pose, especially when we hand over full control to computers and remove humans from the loop. So that will segue nicely into the first question I had for you. And that was, what first got you thinking about lethal autonomous weapons? What first gave you reason for concern? What gave me concern about the development of lethal autonomous weapons was to see prototype weapons being developed. And knowing um, the challenges that AI poses, we're still a long way away from having machines that are as intelligent as humans. And, and knowing the limitations... Um, being very concerned that we were handing over control to machines that weren't technically capable and certainly weren't morally capable of making the right choices. And therefore, to I felt a responsibility as, as any scientist that we want AI to be used for good and, and, and not for, for bad purposes. Unfortunately, like, like many technologies, it's, it's completely dual use. They're pretty much the same algorithms that are going to go into your autonomous car, that are going to identify, track and avoid pedestrians and cyclists. They're going to go into autonomous drones. They're going to identify combatants track them and kill them. It's, it's a very small change to turn one algorithm into the other. And we're going to want autonomous cars. They're going to bring great benefits to our lives, save lots of lives, give mobility to the elderly, to the young, to the disabled. So there can be great benefits for those algorithms, but equally the same algorithms can be repositioned and used to make warfare much more terrible and much more terrifying. And with AI, we've seen some breakthroughs in recent years, just generally speaking, do any of those give you reason to worry that these autonomous weapons are closer than maybe we thought they might have been five or 10 years ago? Or has the trajectory been sort of consistent? The recent breakthroughs have to be put into the context in that they've, they've been in things like games, like the game of Go, very narrow focused task with, without uncertainty. The real world doesn't interfere when you're playing a game of Go. It's very precise rules, a very constrained set of actions that you need to do and to things that you need to think about. And so whilst it's good to see progress in, in these narrow domains, we're still not making much progress. There's still a huge amount to be done to build machines that are as intelligent as us. But it's not machines as intelligent as us that I'm very worried about, although that will be in 50 or 100 years' time when we have them. That will be something that we'll have to think about then. It's actually stupid AI, the fact that we're already thinking about giving responsibility to quite stupid algorithms. And that, that really cannot make the right distinctions, uh, either in a technical sense, in terms of being able to dis distinguish combatants and civilians, as is required by international humanitarian law, and also from a moral ground, that they, they really can't uh, decide things like proportionality. They, they, they can't make the moral distinctions that humans have. They don't have any of the things like empathy and, and uh, consciousness and that allow us to make those difficult decisions that are made in the battlefield. If we do continue on our current path and we aren't able to get a ban on these weapons, what concerns do you have? What do you fear will happen or what do you anticipate? What type of weapons? Well, the problems I think with the debate is that people try and conflate the concerns that we have into just one concern. And there's different concerns at different points in time and different developments of the technology. So the concerns I have in the next 10 years or so are different than the concerns I would have in 50 years' time. And the concerns I would have in the next 10 years or so is, is largely around incompetence. The machines would not be capable of making the right distinctions. And later on, there are concerns that come with, as the machines become more competent, that, that different concerns 
that they would actually now change the speed, the duration, the accuracy of war, and that they would be very terrible weapons. But any ethical safeguards that we could at that point go in uh, might be removed by bad actors. And sadly, plenty of bad actors out there who would be willing to remove any of the ethical safeguards that we might build in. So there's not one concern. I think, unfortunately, when you hear the discussion, often it's you know, people try and distill it down to just a single concern at a single point in time. And depending on the state of the technology, there are different concerns as the technology gets more sophisticated and more mature. But, but certainly to begin with, I, w- I would be very concerned that we were introducing rather stupid algorithms into the battlefield and they couldn't make the right moral and the right um, technical distinctions that are required under AHL. Have you been keeping track at all of what sort of developments have been coming out of different countries? You can see, if you just go to YouTube, you can see there are prototype weapons in pretty much every theater of the battle in the air. There are autonomous drones, and the A systems have the Tyrannus drone that has now been under development for a number of years. Um, on the sea, the U.S. Navy's launched more than a year ago now its first fully autonomous ship. Interestingly, when it was launched, they said it would just have defensive measures on it to be used for hunting for mines, hunting for submarines, and now they're talking about putting weapons on it. Under the sea, we have an autonomous submarine. Boeing have an autonomous submarine the size of a bus that's leaved to be able to cross the Pacific fully autonomously. And on land, there are a number of different um, autonomous weapons that certainly there are prototypes of, autonomous tanks, autonomous sentry robots, and, and, and the like. So there is a bit of an arms race happening, and, and it, it's certainly very worrying to see that so we're sort of locked into one of these bad equilibria where everyone is racing to develop these weapons, in part just because the other side is. China is definitely one of the countries to be worried about. I mean, it's made very clear its ambitions to seek economic military dominance through the use, in large part, of technologies like artificial intelligence, and it's investing very heavily to do that. The military and, and commercial companies are very tightly close together. That will give it quite a unique position, perhaps even some technical advantages to the development of AI, especially in the battlefield. So it was quite surprising. I, I, all of us at the UN meeting in April were, were pretty surprised when China came out and called for a ban on the deployment of autonomous weapons. It didn't say anything about development of autonomous weapons. So that's probably not as far as I would like countries to go, because if they're deployed, then you still run the risk that they will be used accidentally or otherwise. Um, the world is still not as as safe as if they're not actually out there with their triggers waiting to go. So it's interesting to see uh, that they made that call. It's it's hard to know um, whether they're just being disruptive or whether they really do uh, see uh, the serious concerns that uh, we have. I've talked to my colleagues, academic researchers in China, and they've been certainly in private sympathetic to the cause of regulating autonomous weapons. Of course, unfortunately, China is a country in which it's not possible in many respects to talk freely. And so they've made it very clear that it would be a career-killing move for them perhaps to speak publicly like scientists in the West have done about these issues. Nevertheless, we have drawn signatures from Hong Kong where it is possible to speak a bit more freely, which I think demonstrates that within the scientific community internationally, across nations, that there is actually broad support for these sorts of actions that the local politics may prevent scientists from speaking out in their home country. A lot of the discussion around lethal autonomous weapons focuses on the humanitarian impact, but I was wondering if you could speak at all to the potential destabilizing effect that they could have for countries. One of the aspects of autonomous weapons that I don't think is discussed enough is quite how destabilizing they will be as a technology, that they will be relatively easy, certainly cheap, to get your hands on. As I was saying when I was in Korea most recently to the Koreans, the presence of autonomous weapons would make South Korea even less safe than it is today. A country like North Korea has demonstrated it's willing to go to great lengths to obtain atomic weapons. And it would be much easier for them to obtain autonomous weapons. And that would put South Korea in a very difficult situation because if, if they were attacked by autonomous weapons and they weren't able to defend themselves adequately, then that would escalate and we might well find ourselves in a nuclear conflict. One that, of course, none of us would like to see. So they will be rather destabilizing. They'll be weapons that fall into the wrong hands. They'll be used not by just by the superpowers. They'll be used by smaller nations, even rogue states. Potentially, they might even be used by terrorist organizations. And then another final aspect that makes them very destabilizing is one of attribution. If someone attacks you with autonomous weapons, it's going to be very hard to know who's attacked you. It's not like you can, if you bring one of the weapons down, you can open it up and look inside. It's not going to tell you who launched it. 
there's not a radio signal you can follow back to a base to find out who's actually controlling this. So it's, it's going to be very hard to work out who's attacking you, and, and the countries will deny vehemently that it's hit them even they, when they've attacked you. So they will be um, perfect weapons of terror, perfect weapons for troubling nations to um, do their troubling with. One other concern that I have as a, as a scientist is the risk of the field receiving a bad reputation by the misuse of the technology. We've seen this in areas like genetically modified crops, that the great benefits that we might have had for that technology, making crops more disease resistant, more climate resistant, and that we need, in fact, to deal with the pressing problems that climate change and growing populations put on our planet, have been negated by the fact that people were distrustful of the technology. And, and we run a similar sort of risk, I think, with artificial intelligence, that if people see the AI being used to fight terrible wars and to be used against civilians and, and other people, that the technology will, will have a stain on it. And that all the many good uses and the great potential for the technology might be at risk because people will turn against all sorts of development of artificial intelligence. And so that's another risk and another reason many of my colleagues feel you know, we have to speak out very vocally to ensure that we get the benefits and that the public doesn't turn against the whole idea of AI being used to improve the planet. Can you talk about the difference between an AI weapon and an autonomous weapon? Sure. There's plenty of good things that the military can use artificial intelligence for. In fact, the U.S. military has historically been one of the greatest funders of AI research. There's lots of good things you can use artificial intelligence for in, in the battlefield and elsewhere. No one should risk a life or limb clearing a minefield. A perfect job for a robot. If it goes wrong, you blow up the robot, you can replace the robot easily. Equally, filtering through all the information coming at you, making sure that you can work out who are combatants and who are civilians, using AI to help your situational awareness. Again, that's a perfect job that will actually save lives, stop some of the mistakes that inevitably happen in the fog of war and, and in other lots of other areas in logistics and so on. There's lots of good things in the humanitarian aid that AI will be used for. So I, I'm not against um, the use of AI in the military setting. I can see great potential for it to save lives and to make war less dangerous. But there is a, a complete difference when we look at removing humans completely from the decision loop in a weapon and, and ending up with a, a fully autonomous weapon, where it is the machine that is making the final decision as to who lives and who dies. And, and as I said before, that raises you know, many technical, moral, and legal questions you know, we, that we shouldn't go down that line. And ultimately, you know, I think there's a very big moral argument, which is that we shouldn't hand over those sorts of decisions that would, that would be taking us into a completely new moral territory that we've, we've never seen before in lives. Warfare is a terrible thing, and we sanction it um, in part because we're risking our own lives, and it should be a matter of last resort, not something that we hand over easily to machines. Is there anything else that you think we should talk about? I can. I think we want to talk about whether regulating autonomous weapons, regulating AI, would hinder the benefits for peaceful and non-military uses. I'm very unconcerned, as many of my colleagues, that if we regulate autonomous weapons, that, that will actually hinder the development in any way at all of the peaceful and the good uses of AI. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, I'm actually much more fearful that if we don't regulate, there will be a backlash against the technology as a whole, and that will actually hinder the good uses of AI. So I'm completely unconcerned, just like the bans on chemical weapons have not held back chemistry, the bans on biological weapons have not held back biology, and the bans on nuclear weapons have not held back the development of peaceful uses of nuclear power. So I'm completely unconcerned, as many of my colleagues are, that regulating autonomous weapons will, will actually hold back the field in, in any way at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Regulations for lethal autonomous weapons will be more effective if the debate is framed in a more meaningful way. So I'm happy Richard Moyes could talk about how the concept of meaningful human control has helped move the debate in a more focused direction. I'm Richard Moyes, and I'm Managing Director of Article 36, which is a non-governmental organization which focuses on issues of weapons policy and weapons law internationally. So to start, you have done a lot of work. I think you're credited with coining the phrase meaningful human control. And so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, first, what are some of the complications around sort of defining whether or not a human is involved and in control? And maybe if you could explain some of the human in the loop and on the loop ideas a little bit. We developed and, and started using the term meaningful human control really as an effort to try and get the debate on autonomous weapons focused on the human element, the form and nature of human engagement that we want to retain as autonomy develops in, in different aspects of weapons function. So first of all, that's a term that's designed to try and structure the debate towards thinking about that human element. 
I suppose the most simple question that we raised early on when proposing this term was really a recognition that I think everybody realizes that some form of human control would be needed over new weapon technologies. Nobody is really proposing weapon systems that operate without any human control whatsoever. And at the same time, I think people can also recognize that simply having a human being pressing a button when they're told to do so by a computer screen without really having any understanding of what the situation is that they're responding to, having a human simply pressing a button without understanding of the of the context also doesn't really involve human control. So even though in that latter situation, you might have a human in the loop, as that phrase goes, unless that human has some substantial understanding of what the context is and and what the implications of their actions are, then simply a pro forma human engagement doesn't seem sufficient either. So in a way, the term meaningful human control was put forward as a way of shifting the debate onto that human element but also putting on the table this question of, well, what's the quality of human engagement that we really need to see in these interactions in order to feel that our our humanity is being retained in the use of force? So has that been successful in helping to frame the debate? I think this sort of terminology, of course, different actors use different terms. Some people talk about necessary human control or sufficient human control or necessary human judgment. There's different word choices there. I think there are pros and cons to those different choices, but we don't tend to get too hung up on the specific wording that's chosen there. The key thing is that these are seen bundled together as being a critical area now for discussion amongst states and other actors in multilateral diplomatic conversation about where the limits of autonomy and weapon systems lie. I think coming out of the group of governmental experts meeting of the Convention on Conventional Weapons that took place earlier this year, I think the conclusion of that meeting was more or less that this human element really does now need to be the focus of discussion and negotiation. So one way or another, I think the debate has shifted quite effectively onto this issue of the human element. What are you hoping for in this upcoming meeting? Well, perhaps what I'm hoping for and what we're going to get or what we're likely to get might be rather different things. I would say I'd be hoping for states to start to put forward more substantial elaborations of what they consider the necessary human control, human element in the use of force to be. So more substance on that policy side would be a helpful start to give us material where we can start to see the differences and the similarities in states' position. However, I suspect that the meeting in August is going to focus mainly on procedural issues around the adoption of the chair's report and the framing of what's called the mandate for future work of the group of governmental experts. So that probably means that rather than so much focus on the substance, we're going to hear a lot of procedural talk in the room. That said, in the margins, I think there's still a very good opportunity for us to start to build uh, confidence and a sense of partnership amongst states and non-governmental organizations and other actors who are keen to work towards the negotiation of an instrument on autonomous weapon systems. I think building that partnership between sort of progressive states and civil society actors and and perhaps others from the corporate sector, building that partnership is going to be critical to developing a political dynamic for the period ahead. I'd like to go back quickly to this idea of human control. A while back, I talked with Heather Roth and she gave this example, I think it was the empty hangar problem. And essentially what it is, is no one expects some military leader to walk down to the airplane hangar and discover that the planes have all gone off to war without anyone saying something. And I think that sort of gets at some of the confusion as to what human control looks like. I mean, you'd mentioned briefly that the idea that a computer tells a human to push a button and the human does that. But even in fully autonomous weapon systems, I think there would still be humans somewhere in picture. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on maybe some specifics of what it looks like for a human to have control or maybe where it starts to get fuzzy. I think that we recognize that in the development of weapon technologies, already we see significant uh, levels of automation and a a degree of handing over certain functions to sensors and to assistance from algorithms and the like. There are a number of areas that I think are of particular concern to us. And I think in a way, this is to recognize that a commander needs to have a sufficient contextual understanding of where it is that actual applications of force are are likely to occur. Already, we have weapon systems that might be projected 
over a relatively small area. And within that area, they will identify the heat shape of a armored fighting vehicle, for example, and they may direct force against that object. Now, that's relatively accepted in current practice, but I think it's accepted so long as we recognize that the area over which any application of force may occur is actually relatively bounded, and it's occurring relatively shortly after a commander has initiated that mission. Where I think my concerns, our concerns lie, is that that model of operation could be expanded over a greater area of space on the ground and over a longer period of time. And as that period of time and that area of space on the ground increase, then the ability of a commander to actually make an informed assessment about the likely implications of the specific applications of force that take place within that envelope becomes significantly diluted to the point of being more or less meaningless. For us, this is linked also to the concept of attacks as a term in international law. There's a legal obligation that bears on human commanders at the sort of unit of the attack. So there are certain legal obligations that a human has to fulfill for an attack. Now, an attack doesn't mean firing one bullet. An attack could retain a number of applications of actual force. But it seems to us that if you simply expand the space and the time over which an individual weapon system can identify target objects for itself, ultimately you're eroding that notion of an attack, which is actually a fundamental building block of the structure of the law. You're, you're diluting that legal framework to the point of it arguably being meaningless. So we want to see a, a reasonably constrained period of, say, let's call it independence of operation for a system. It, it may not be fully independent, but where a commander has the ability to sufficiently understand the contextual parameters within which that operation is occurring. Can you speak at all, since you live in the UK, on what the UK stance is on autonomous weapons right now? I would say that the UK has so far been a, a somewhat reluctant dance partner on the issue of autonomous weapons. But I do see some, I think, positive signs of movement in the UK's policy articulations recently. One of the main problems they've had in the past is that they adopted a definition of lethal autonomous weapon systems, which is the terminology used in the CCW. It's undetermined what this term lethal autonomous weapon systems means. That's a sort of moving target in the debate, which makes the discussion quite complicated. But the UK adopted a definition of that term, which was somewhat in the realm of science fiction as far as we're concerned. They describe lethal autonomous weapon systems as having the ability to understand a commander's intent. And I think in doing so, they, they were sort of suggesting an almost sort of human-like intelligence within this system, which is a long way away, if even possible. It's certainly a long way away from where we are now and where already developments of autonomy and weapon systems are causing legal and, and sort of practical management problems. So by adopting that sort of futuristic definition, they a little bit ruled themselves out of being able to make constructive contributions to the actual debate about how much human control should there be in the use of force. Now, recently in certain publications, the UK has slightly opened up some space to recognize that that definition might actually not be so helpful. And maybe this focus on the human control element that needs to be retained is actually the most productive way forward. Now, how positive the UK will be from my perspective in that discussion and then talking about the level of human control that needs to be retained. I think that remains to be seen, but I think at least they're engaging with some recognition that that's the area where there needs to be more policy substance. So, fingers crossed. I'd ask Richard about the UK's stance on autonomous weapons, but this is a global issue. So I turn to Mary Wareham and Bonnie Doherty for more in-depth information about international efforts at the United Nations to ban lethal autonomous weapons. My name is Bonnie Doherty. I'm a senior researcher at Human Rights Watch and also the director of armed conflict and civilian protection at Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic. And I've been working on fully autonomous weapons since the beginning of the campaign, doing most of the research and writing regarding the issue for Human Rights Watch and Harvard. And this is Mary Wareham. I'm the advocacy director of the arms division at Human Rights Watch, and I serve as the global coordinator of the campaign to stop killer robots. This is the coalition of non-governmental organizations that we've co-founded towards the end of 2012 and launched in April 2013. What prompted the formation of the campaign to stop killer robots? Well, Human Rights Watch picked up this issue. We published our first report in 2012. 
And our concern was the development of this new technology that raised a host of concerns, uh, legal concerns, compliance with international humanitarian law and human rights law, moral concerns, accountability concerns, scientific concerns, and so forth. And so we launched a report that was initial foray into the issues and why trying to preempt the development of these weapons before they came into existence, because the genie's out of the bottle, it's hard to, to put it back in, hard to get countries to give up a new technology. Maybe I can follow up there just to establish the campaign to stop killer robots. I did a lot of legwork in 2011, 2012, talking to a lot of the people that Bonnie was talking to for the preparation of her report. But my questions were more about what should we do once we launch this report? Do you share the same concerns that we have at Human Rights Watch? And if so, is there a need for a coordinated international uh, civil society coalition to organize us going forward and to present a united voice and position to governments who we want to take action on this? For us, do, working that way in a coalition with other non-governmental organizations is what we do. We've been doing it for the last two decades through on other humanitarian disarmament issues, the international campaign to ban landmines, the cluster munition coalition. We find it's more effective when we all try to work together uh, and provide a coordinated civil society voice. And there was strong interest, and therefore we co-founded the campaign to stop killer robots. What prompted you to consider a ban versus you're trying to, I I guess I don't know what other options there might have been. So we felt from the beginning that what is needed to address fully autonomous weapons is a preemptive ban on development, production, and use. Some people have argued that existing laws is adequate. Some people have argued you only need to regulate it to limit it to certain circumstances. But in our mind, a ban is essential, and that draws on past work on other conventional weapons, such as landmines and cluster munitions, and more recently, nuclear weapons. The reason for a ban is that if you allow these weapons to exist, even to to come into being, to be in, in countries' arsenals, they will inevitably get in the hands of dictators or rogue actors that will use them against the law and against the rules of morality. They will harm combatants as well as civilians. And it's, it's impossible once a weapon exists to restrict it to a certain circumstance. And I think those who favor regulation assume the, the user will follow all the rules, and that's just not the way it happens. And we need to believe it should be preemptive because once they come into existence, it's too late. They'll be harder to control. And so if you prevent them from even happening, that will be the most effective solution. And the, the last point I'd make is that it also increases the stigma against the weapons, which can influence even countries that aren't party to a treaty banning them. And this has proven the case in past weapons treaties. And even there's been a preemptive ban on blinding lasers in the 1990s, and that's been very effective. So there is legal precedent for this and many arguments for why a ban is the best solution. Yeah, there's two ways of framing that call, which is not just the call of Human Rights Watch, but the call of the campaign to stop killer robots. We seek a preemptive ban on the development, production and use of fully autonomous weapons. That's the kind of negative way of framing it. The positive way is that we want to retain meaningful human control over the use of force and over weapon systems going forward. There's a lot of interest, and I'd say convergence, on those two points. We're five years on uh, since the launch of the campaign. 26 countries are now supporting the call for a ban and, and actively trying to get us there. And an even larger number of countries, actually virtually all of the ones who've spoken to date on this topic, acknowledge the need for some form of human control over the use of force and over weapon systems going forward. And it's been interesting to see in the five diplomatic meetings that governments have held on this topic since May 2014, the discussions keep returning to the notion of human control and the role of the human and how we can retain that going forward. Because autonomy and artificial intelligence are going to be used by militaries. What we want to do, though, is draw a normative line and provide some guidance and a a framework going forward that we can work with. You just referred to them as fully autonomous weapons. At FLI, we usually talk about lethal autonomous weapons versus non-lethal fully autonomous weapons. And so that sort of drives me to the question of to what extent do definitions matter? And then this is probably a completely different question. How are lethal autonomous weapons different from conventional weapons? The reason I'm combining these two questions is because I'm guessing definition does play a little bit of a role there, but I'm not sure. Well, it's important to have for countries to make international law, they have to have a general common understanding of what we're talking about. But generally, in a legal treaty, 
The last thing to be articulated is the actual definition. So it's premature to get a detailed technical definition, but we feel that although a variety of names have been used, lethal autonomous weapons systems, fully autonomous weapons, killer robots, in essence, they're all talking about the same thing. They're all talking about a system that can select a target and choose to fire on that target without meaningful human control. There's already convergence around this definition, even if it hasn't been defined in, de- in detail. In terms of conventional munitions, they are, in essence, a conventional munition if they deploy conventional weapons. So it depends on what the payload is. If the fully autonomous system were launching nuclear weapons, it would not be a conventional weapon. If it's launching cluster munitions, it would be conventional. So it's it's not right to say they're not conventional weapons. And the talks are being held at the Convention on Conventional Weapons in Geneva. This is where governments decided to house this topic. I think it's natural for people to want to talk about definitions from the beginning. That's what you do with a new topic, right? You try and figure out the boundaries of what you're discussing here. And those talks in Geneva and the reporting that has been done to date and all of the discourse, I think, has been pretty clear that this campaign and this focus on fully autonomous weapons is about kinetic weapons. It's not about cyber per se. It's about actual things that can kill people physically. And it's about, I think, the ICRC, the Red Cross, has made an important contribution with its suggestion to focus on the critical functions of weapon systems, which is what we were doing in the campaign. We just weren't calling it that. But that's this action of identifying and selecting a target and then firing on it, using force, lethal or otherwise. Those are the two functions that we want to ensure remain under human control, under meaningful human control. For some others, some other states, they like to draw what we call the very wide definition of meaningful human control. For some of them, it means good programming, (laughs) nice design, a weapons review, a kind of legal review of, of if the weapon system will be legal and if they can proceed to develop it. You could kind of cast a very wide loop when you're talking about meaningful human control. But for us, the crux of the whole thing is about this notion of selecting targets and firing on them. And so what are the concerns that you have about this idea of non-human control? What worries you about that? Of autonomy in weapon systems? Yeah, essentially. Yes. We've articulated legal concerns here at Human Rights Watch just because that's where we always start and that's Bonnie's area of expertise. But, you know, there are much broader concerns here that we're also worried about too. This notion of crossing a moral line and permitting a machine to take human life on the battlefield or in policing or in border control and other circumstances, that's abhorrent and that's something that the Nobel Peace Laureates, the faith leaders and the others involved in the campaign to stop killer robots want to prevent. That For them, that's a step too far. They also worry about outsourcing killing to machines. Where's the ethics in that? And then what impact is this going to have on the system that we have in place globally? How will it be destabilizing in various regions? Uh, And as a whole, what will happen when dictators and one-party states and military regimes get hold of fully autonomous weapons? How will they use them? How will non-state armed groups use them? I would just add, building on what Mary said, another reason human control is so important is that humans bring judgment. They bring legal and ethical judgment based on their innate characteristics, on their understanding of another human being, of the mores of a culture, and that a robot cannot bring. Certain things cannot be programmed. So, for example, when they're weighing whether the military band will justify an attack if it causes civilian harm, they apply that judgment, which both legal and ethical, and a robot won't have that. That's a human thing. So, Losing humanity and in, in use of force potentially violate the law and as well as raise serious moral concerns that Mary discussed. I want to go back to the process to get these weapons banned. It's been going on for quite a few years now. I was curious, is that slow or is that just sort of the normal speed for banning a weapon? Look at nuclear weapons, Ariel. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That took a while. <laughs> that's a slow, that took 70 years, you know, and that's the example that we're trying to avoid here. We don't want to be negotiating non-proliferation treaty in 20 years time, you know, with the small number of countries who've got these and the, and the other states who don't. We're at a crossroads here. So, yeah, sorry to interrupt you there. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was a good point. You know, there have been five meetings on this topic to date at the United Nations in Geneva, but each of those meetings has only been up to a week long. So really it's only five weeks of talks that have happened in the last four years. That's not much time to make a lot of progress to get everybody around the same table understanding. But I think there's definitely been some progress in those talks to delineate the parameters of this issue, 
to explore it and begin to pull apart the notion of human control and how you can ensure that that's retained in weapon systems and the selection of targets and the use of force. There's a wide range of different levels of knowledge on this issue, not just in civil society and academia and in the public, but also within governments. So there's a lot of legwork to be done there to increase the awareness, but also the confidence of governments to feel like they can deal with this. And what's happened, especially I think in the past year, has been increased calls to now move from exploring the issue and talking about the parameters of the challenge to what are we going to do about it? And that's going to be the big debate at the next meeting, which is coming up uh, at the end of August, is what will the recommendation be for future work? Are the governments going to keep talking about this, which we hope they do, but what are they going to do about it, more importantly? And we're seeing, I think, a groundswell of support now for moving towards an outcome. States realize that they do not have the time or the money to waste on inconclusive deliberations. And so they're meant to be exploring options on pathways forward, but there's really not that many options. As has been mentioned, you know, they could, states can talk about international law and the existing rules and how they can apply them and have more transparency there. But I think we've moved beyond that. So there's kind of a couple of possibilities which will be debated. One is political measures, political non-binding declaration. Can we get agreement on some form of principles over human control? That sounds good, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. And so we could create new international law. How did we do that in this particular treaty at the Convention on Conventional Weapons? You move to a negotiating mandate and you set the objective of negotiating a new protocol under the Convention on Conventional Weapons. At the moment, there has been no agreement to move to negotiate new international law But we're expecting that to be the main topic of debate at the next meeting because they have to decide now what they're going to do next year. For us, the biggest, I think, developments are happening outside of the room right now rather than in Geneva itself. There's a lot of activity now starting to happen in national capitals by governments to try and figure out what their position is on this, what their policy is on this. But there's more prodding and questioning and debate starting to happen in national parliaments. And that has to happen in order to determine what the government position is on this and and what's going to happen on it. And then we have the examples of the open letters, the sign-on letters, ethical principles. There's all sorts of new things that are coming out in recent weeks that I think will be relevant to what the governments are discussing. And we hope we'll provide them with impetus to move forward with focus and purpose here. So we we can't put a timeline on by when they might create a new international treaty, but we're saying you can do this quickly if you put your mind to it and you say that this is what you want to try and achieve. So we believe that if they move to a negotiating mandate at the end of this year, they could negotiate the treaty next year. Negotiating the treaty is not the part that takes the long time. You know, it's about getting everybody into the position where they want to create new international law. The actual process of negotiating that law should be relatively swift. If it takes longer than a year or two, then it runs the risk of turning into another set of inconclusive deliberations that don't produce anything. So for us, the goal is absolutely crucial to get in there at the beginning. And the goal at the moment has gone from informal talks to formal talks, but still with no option or outcome. What is some of the resistance that you're facing to moving towards a ban? Are governments worried that they're going to miss out on a great technology, or is there some other reason that they're resisting? Just to say, 85 countries have spoken out on this topic to date. Most of them not at any great length, but just to say this is important. We're concerned. We support the international talks. We have a majority of countries now who want to move towards negotiating new international law. Who's the blockages at the moment? At the last round of talks and at the previous ones, it was basically Israel, Russia and the United States who were saying it's premature to decide where these talks should lead. We need to further explore and discuss the issues before we can make any progress. For others now, they're just people are less patient with that position. And it will be interesting to see if those three countries in particular change their minds here. The particular treaty that we're at, the Convention on Conventional Weapons, the states there take their decisions by consensus, which means they can't vote. There's no voting procedures there. They have to strive for consensus where everybody in the room agrees or at least does not object with moving forward. So that that threat of a kind of a blocking of consensus is always there, especially from Russia. But we'll, we'll see. 
there's no kind of pro-killer robot state which is saying we want these things, we need these things right now, at least not in the diplomatic talks. The only countries who've wanted to talk about the potential advantages or benefits are Israel and the United States. All of the other countries who speak about this are more concerned about understanding and coming to grips with all of the challenges that are raised and then figuring out what the regulatory framework should be. And Bonnie, was there anything you'd wanted to add to that? I think Mary summarized the key points. I was just going to say that there's some people who would argue that we should wait and see what the technology would bring. We don't know where it'll go. And our argument counter to that is something called the precautionary principle, that even if there's scientific uncertainty about where a technology will go, if there's a significant risk of public harm, which there is in this case, that the scientific uncertainty should not stand in the way of action. And I think that the growing number of states that have expressed concern about these weapons and the the majority, which have the almost consensus emerging around the need for human control, show that there is willingness to act at this point. As Mary said, this is not a situation where people are advocating. And I think that in the long run, the agreement that there should be human control over the use of force will outweigh any hesitation based on the wait and see approach. We had a good uh, proposal, or not proposal, but offer from the United Nations Secretary General in this big agenda for disarmament framework that he launched a couple of months ago, saying that he stands ready to support the efforts of UN member states to elaborate new measures on lethal autonomous weapon systems, including legally binding arrangements. For him, you know, he wants states to ensure that humans remain at all times in control over the use of force. So to have that kind of offer of support from the highest level at the United Nations, I think is very important. And the other recent pledges and commitments, the one by the 200 technology companies and more than 2,600 scientists and AI experts and other individuals committing not to develop lethal autonomous weapon systems, that's a very powerful message, I think, to the states that these groups and individuals are not going to wait for the regulation. They're committing not to do it. And this is what they expect the governments to do as well. We also saw the ethical principles issued by Google in recent weeks and this pledge by the company not to design or develop artificial intelligence for use in weapons. All of these efforts and initiatives are very relevant to what states need to do going forward. And this is why we, in the campaign to stop killer robots, welcome them and encourage them and want to ensure that we have as much of a broad-based appeal to support the government action that we need taken. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening with China? Because they've sort of supported a ban. They're listed as supporting a ban, but it's complicated. It's funny because so many other countries that have come forward and endorsed the call for a ban have not elicited the same amount of attention. I guess that's, you know, it's obviously interesting, though, for China to do this because everybody knows about the investments that China is making into into military applications of artificial intelligence and autonomy. And and we see the weapon systems that are in development at the moment, including swarms of very small miniature drones. And where will that head? So what China thinks about this issue matters. And at the last meeting, China basically endorsed the call for a ban, but said, there's always a but, that their support was limited to prohibiting use only and to not address development or production. So for us, it's a partial ban. But we put them on the list that the campaign maintains, and they're the first state to have an asterisk by its entry saying, look, China is on the ban list, but it's not, you know, not fully committed here. But we needed to acknowledge that because it wasn't really the first time that China had hinted it would support creating new international law. It has been hinting at this in previous papers, including one that found that China's review of existing international law found so many questions and doubts raised that it does see a need to create international law specific to fully autonomous weapon systems. And China gave the example of the blinding lasers protocol at the CCW, which prohibits laser weapons that would permanently blind human soldiers. And I think the real news on China is that its position now saying that existing law is insufficient and we need to create new international rules splits the P5, the permanent members of the five members of the United Nations Security Council. You have Russia and the United States arguing that it's too early to determine what the outcome should be. Uh, and, And the UK, Richard can explain better exactly what the UK wants, but it seems to be satisfied with the status quo. And then France is pursuing a political declaration, but not legally binding measures. So there's, there's not unity anymore 
and that group of five permanent members of the Security Council. And and those states do matter because they're some of the ones who are best placed to be developing and and investing uh, in increasingly autonomous weapon systems. Okay. And I wanted to also ask, unrelated, right now what, what you're trying to do, what we're trying to do is get a ban, a preemptive ban on a weapon that doesn't exist. What are some examples in the past of that having succeeded? as opposed to proving some humanitarian disaster is the result of a weapon? Well, the main precedent for that is the preemptive ban on blinding lasers, which is a protocol to the Convention on Conventional Weapons. And we did some research a few years ago into the motives behind the preemptive ban on blinding lasers, and many of them are the same. They raise concerns about the ethics of permanently blinding someone, whether it's a combatant or a civilian. They raise concerns about the threat of an arms race. They raise concerns that there be a ban, but that it not impede peaceful development in the area. And that ban has been very successful and has not impeded peaceful use of lasers for many, many civilian purposes. But it has created a stigma against and a legally binding rule against using blinding lasers. So we think that that's an excellent model for fully autonomous weapons. And it also appeared in the same treaty at which these fully autonomous weapons or lethal autonomous weapon systems are being discussed right now. So it's a good it's a good model to look at. Well, yeah, I really like that paper that you did on the other precedents for, you know, retaining human control over weapon systems. The notion that looking at past weapons that have been prohibited and finding that in many instances, it's because of the uncontrollable effects that the weapons create from chemical weapons and biological and toxin ones to anti-personnel landmines, where once deployed, you cannot control them anymore. And this is the kind of notion of being able to control the weapon system once it's activated that has driven those previous negotiations, right? Correct. There's precedent for both the preemptive ban, but there's also precedent for a desire to maintain human control over weapons. And as Mary said, there are several treaties, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and landmines all have been banned in large part because people in governments were concerned about losing control over the weapon system. In essence, it's the same model here that by launching fully autonomous weapons, you'd be losing control over the use of force. So I think there's a precedent for a ban and there's precedent for a preemptive ban, all of which are applicable in this situation. I talked to Paul Chere a little bit earlier, and one of the things that he talked about were treaties that were developed as a result of the powers that be recognizing that the weapon would be too big of a risk for them. And so they agreed to ban a weapon. And then the other sort of driving force for treaties was usually civil societies and based on sort of the general public saying this, this is not OK. What role do you see for both of those situations here? There's a multitude of reasons of why these weapons should be banned. And I think both the ones you mentioned are valid in this case. From our point of view, the main concern is a humanitarian one, and that's civil society's focus. We're concerned about the risk to civilians. We're concerned about um, moral issues and, and, and those matters. And that builds on past what they call humanitarian disarmament treaties, treaties designed to protect humanity through legal norms through and, and traditionally often through bans, of bans of cl- landmines, cluster munitions, and nuclear weapons. There have been other treaties, that sometimes they overlap, that have been driven more for security reasons, countries that are concerned about other nations getting their hands on these weapons and that they feel in the long run it's better for no one to have them for than for others to have them. Certainly chemical weapons was an example of that. This does not mean a treaty can't be motivated for both reasons. That that often happens, but I think and I think both reasons are applicable here, but they just have come from slightly different trajectories. I mean, it's pretty amazing some of the diplomatic talks that we've been on on killer robots where we hear hear the governments debating the ethics of whether or not a specific weapon system, such as fully autonomous weapons, should be permitted, should be allowed. It's rare that 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 happens. Normally, we are dealing with the aftermath, with the consequences of proliferation and and of widespread use and widespread production and stockpiling. This is an opportunity to do something in advance here. And it does kind of lead to a little bit of a, I'd say, a north-south divide between the kind of, you know, the military powers who have the resources at their disposal to invest in increasingly autonomous technology and try and push the boundaries 
And then the vast majority of countries who, who are asking, what's the point of all of this? Where is the relevance of the UN Charter, which talks about general and complete disarmament as being the ultimate objective? They ask, have we lost that goal here? Is, is the ultimate objective to create more and better and more sophisticated weapon systems? Uh, or is it to end war and deal with the consequences through disarmament of warfare? Those are kind of really big picture questions that are, are raised in this debate and, and ones that we, we leave to those governments to make. But I think it is indicative of why there is so much interest in this particular concern. And that's demonstrated by just the sheer number of governments who are participating in the international talks. The international talks, they're in the setting called a group of governmental experts. But this is not about a, you know, a dozen guys sitting around the table in a small room. This is a big plenary meeting with more than 80 countries following, engaging and avidly trying to figure out what to do. In terms of just sort of helping people understand how the UN works, what role does a group like the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots play in the upcoming meeting? If ultimately the decision is made by the states and the nations, what is your role? Our role is, a, you know, 24-7 all year round. These international meetings only happen a couple of times a year. This will be the second week this year. Most of our work has been this year happening in capitals and, and in places outside of the diplomatic meetings because that's where you really make progress is through the parliamentary initiatives, through reaching the high level political leadership, through engaging the public, through talking to the media and getting a, an increased awareness about the challenges here and the need for action. All of those things are what makes things move inside the room with the diplomacy because the diplomats need instructions from capital in order to really progress. So at the meeting itself, we seek to provide a diverse delegation that's not just people from Europe and North America, but from around the world, because this is a multilateral meeting. We need to ensure that we can reach out and engage with all of the delegates in the room, because every country matters on this issue and every country has questions. Can we answer all those questions? Probably not, but we can talk through them uh, with those states try and address the concerns and try and be a, a valued partner in the deliberations that are happening. It's the normal way of working for us here at Human Rights Watch is to work alongside other organizations through coordinated civil society initiatives so that you don't go to the meeting and have like 50 statements from different NGOs. You have just a few, you know, or just one so that you can be absolutely clear and guiding where you want to see the deliberations go and the outcome that you want. We'll be holding side events and other efforts to engage with the delegates in, in different ways, uh, as well as presenting new research and reports. I think you've got something coming up, Bonnie, right? We'll be releasing a new report on Martin's Clause, which is a, a provision of international law, the Geneva Conventions and other treaties that brings ethics into law. And it basically has two prongs, which we'll elaborate in the report, but talking about that countries must comply with the principles of humanity and the dictates of public conscience, which in short, we believe fully autonomous weapons raise concerns under both of those. We believe losing human control will violate basic principles of humanity and that there's the groundswell of opposition that's growing among not only governments, but also faith leaders, scientists, tech companies, academics, a civil society, etc., all show that the public conscience is coming out against fully autonomous weapons and for maintaining human control over the use of force. To continue with this idea of ethical issues surrounding lethal autonomous weapons, we're joined now by Peter Asaro. So I'm Peter Asaro. I'm an associate professor uh, in the School of Media Studies at the New School University in New York City. And I'm also the uh, co-founder and vice chair of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, which is part of the leadership and steering committee of the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, which is a coalition of NGOs that's working at the UN to ban fully autonomous weapons. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with this and what first gave you cause for concern? My background is in philosophy and computer science, and I did a lot of work in artificial intelligence and in the philosophy of artificial intelligence, as well as the history of science and early computing and the development of neural networks, and the sort of mathematical and computational theories behind all of that. In the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s was my graduate work. And as part of that, I got really interested in the kind of modern or contemporary applications of both artificial intelligence and robotics, and specifically the kind of embodied forms of 
artificial intelligence, which are robotic in various ways, and uh, got really interested in not just intelligence, but social interaction. And that sort of snowballed into thinking about robot ethics. And what seemed sort of uh, the most pressing issue within robot ethics was the use of violence, the use of force, and whether we would allow robots to kill people. And of course, the first place that that was going to happen would be the military. So I've been thinking a lot about the ethics of military robotics from the perspective of just war theory, but also a broad range of philosophical and legal perspectives as well. And that got me involved with Noel Sharkey and some other people who were interested in this from a policy perspective. And and we launched the International Committee for Robot Arms Control back in 2009. And then in 2012, we got together with Human Rights Watch and a number of other NGOs to form the campaign to stop killer robots. So that leads into the next question I have for you, and it's very broad. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the ethical issues are surrounding robots and more specifically autonomous weapons in warfare? Yeah, well, I think, of course, there's a whole host of ethical issues around robotics in general, um, privacy, safety, sort of the big ones, but all sorts of more complicated ones as well. Job displacement, how we treat them and the impacts on society and things like that. Within the military context, I think the issues are sort of clearer in some sense because it's mostly around the use of autonomous systems in a lethal force. So the primary question is, should we allow uh, autonomous weapon systems to make lethal decisions independently of human control or human judgment, however you frame that? And then sort of subsidiary to that, some would argue, uh, does the programming within a system constitute that kind of human control or decision making? From my perspective, the pre-programming doesn't really do that. And that's because I, I come from a philosophical background. And so we look at, you know, just war theory and you look at ethics and especially Kantian ethics and the requirements for the morality of killing. So killing is generally speaking immoral. But there are certain exceptions, and those are generally uh, self-defense or collective self-defense in the case of war. But in order to justify that killing, you need reasons and justifications. And machines uh, and computational reasoning, at least at this stage of development, is not the type of system that has reasons. It follows rules, and if certain conditions are met and a rule is applied and and a result is obtained, But making a reasoned judgment about whether to use lethal force or whether to take a human life depends on a deeper understanding of of reason. And I think that's a sort of moral agency. It's a moral decision making and moral judgment that requires capacities that automated decision making systems just don't have. Now, maybe down the road in the future, machines will become conscious. Machines will understand the meaning of life. Machines will understand what it means to take a life. Machines will be able to recognize human beings as humans who deserve rights that need to be respected, and and, and systems may understand what it means to have a duty to respect the rights of others. But simply programming rules into machines doesn't really do that. So from a legal perspective as well, there's no real accountability for these sorts of systems because they're not legal agents, they're not moral agents. You cannot sue a computer or a robot. Uh, You cannot charge them with crimes and put them in jail and things like that, right? So we have an entire kind of legal system as well as a moral framework that assumes that humans are the responsible agents and, and the ones making decisions. And as soon as you start replacing that decision making with automated systems, you start to create significant problems for the regulation of these systems and for accountability and for justice. And then that leads directly to problems of safety and control and what kinds of systems are going to be fielded, what are going to be the implications of that for international stability, who's going to have access to that, what are the implications for uh, civilians and civilian infrastructures that might be targeted by these systems. I had wanted to go into some of this legality and liability stuff that you've brought up, and you've sort of given a nice overview of it as it is, but I was hoping you could expand a little bit on how this becomes a liability issue. And also, this is probably sort of an obvious question, but if you could touch a little on just how complicated it is to change the laws so that they would apply to autonomous systems as opposed to humans. (laughs) 
A lot of the work I've been doing under a grant for the Future of Life Institute looks at liability and in increasingly autonomous systems. And within a civilian domestic application, of course, the big application that everybody's looking at at the moment is the self-driving car. So you can ask this question, who's responsible when the self-driving car creates an accident? And the way that liability law works, of course, somebody somewhere is always going to wind up being responsible. The law will find a way to hold somebody responsible. The question is whether existing precedents and the ways of doing things under current legal frameworks is really just or is really the best way going forward as we have these kinds of increasingly autonomous systems. So in terms of holding persons responsible and liable, so under tort law, if you have an accident, then you can sue somebody. So this is criminal law, this is uh, the law of torts. And under that, then you sort of receive monetary compensation for damages done. But ideally, the person or agents or company or uh, what have you that causes the harm is the one that should pay. Of course, that's not always true. And the way that liability works does things like joint and several liability in which even though one party only had a small hand in causing a harm, they may have lots of money, like a government uh, or a state or a city or something like that. And so they may actually wind up paying far more as a share of damages than they actually contributed to a problem. You also have situations of strict liability, such that even if your agency in causing a problem was very limited, you can still be held fully responsible for the implications. There's some interesting parallels here with the keeping of animals, which are kind of autonomous systems, in a sense. They have their minds of their own. They sort of do things. On the other hand, we expect them to be well-made and well-trained, at least for domestic animals. So generally speaking, you have liability for harms caused by your dog or your horse and so forth as a domesticated animal. But you don't have strict liability. So you actually have to show that maybe you've trained your dog to attack or you've failed to you know, properly train your horse or keep it in a stable or what have you. Whereas if you keep a tiger or something like that and it gets out and causes harm, uh, then you're strictly liable. So the question is for a robot. Should you be strictly liable for the robots that you create or the robots that you own? Should corporations that manufacture these systems be strictly liable for all of the accidents of self-driving cars? And while that seems like a good policy uh, from the perspective of the public, because all the harms that are caused by the, these systems will be compensated, that can also stifle innovation. In the car sector, that doesn't seem to be a problem. As it turns out, the president of Volvo said that they will accept strict liability for all of their self-driving cars. Tesla Motors has you know, released a number of autopilot systems for their cars and more or less accepted the liability for that. Although there's only been a few accidents, so the actual jurisprudence or case law is still really emerging around that. But uh, those are, I think, a technology where the cars are very expensive. There's a lot of money to be made in self-driving cars. And so the expectation of the car companies is that there will be very few accidents and that they can really afford to pay the damages for all those accidents. Now, is that going to be true for personal robots? So if you have a personal assistant, sort of butler robot, who maybe goes on shopping errands and things like that for you, there's a potential for them to cause significant economic damage. They're probably not going to be nearly as expensive as cars, hopefully. And it's not clear that the market for them is going to be as big. And it's not clear that companies would be able to absorb the costs of strict liability. So there's a question of whether that's really the best policy for those kinds of systems. Then there's also questions of ability of people to modify their systems. So if you're holding companies strictly responsible for their products, then those companies are not going to allow consumers to modify those products in any way, right? Because that would affect their ability to control them. If you want a kind of DIY culture around autonomous systems and robotics, then you're going to see a lot of people modifying these systems, reprogramming these systems. So you also want, I think, a kind of strict liability around anybody who does those kinds of modifications rather than the manufacturer. And it's a sort of, you know, break the seal and you accept all the responsibility for what happens.
And I think that's sort of one side of it. Now, on the military side of it, you don't really have torts in the same way. There, there's, of course, a couple of extreme issues around torts in war. But generally speaking, militaries do not pay monetary damages when they make mistakes. If they accidentally blow up the wrong building, they don't pay to build a new building. That's just considered a casualty of war and, and an accident. And it's not even necessarily a war crime or anything else because you, you don't have these kind of mechanisms where you can sue an invading army for dropping a bomb in the wrong place. So the idea that liability is going to act as an accountability measure on autonomous systems is, is just silly, I think, in, in warfare, because you just you can't sue people in war, basically. There's a few exceptions, and, and the, the governments that purchase weapon systems can sue the manufacturers. And that's the sort of sense in which there is an ability to do that. But even most of those cases have been largely unsuccessful. Generally, those kinds of lawsuits are based on the contracts and not the actual performance or damages caused by an actual system. So you don't really have that entire regulatory mechanism. So if you have a government that's concerned about not harming civilians and not bombing the wrong buildings and things like that, of course, then they're incentivized to put pressure on manufacturers to build systems that perform well. And that's one of the sort of drivers of that technology. But it's a much weaker force if you think about you know, what the engineers in a car company are thinking about in terms of safety and the kind of bottom line for their company if they make a product that causes accidents versus how that's thought about in a defense company, where certainly they're trying to uh, protect civilians and ensure that systems work correctly, but they don't have that enormously powerful economic concern about lawsuits in the future. So the idea that you know the technology is going to be driven by similar forces, it doesn't really apply. And so that's a big concern, I think, for the development of autonomous systems in the uh, military sphere. Is there a worry or a risk that this sort of, I don't know if it's lack of liability, but maybe just it's whether or not we can trust the systems that are being built. But is there an increased risk of war crimes as a result of autonomous weapons, either intentionally or accidentally? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea that there's an increased risk of war crimes is kind of an interesting question because uh, the answer is simultaneously yes and no, right? What these autonomous systems actually do is, is diminish or remove or put a distance between the accountability of humans and their actions or the consequences of their actions. So if you think of the autonomous system as a sort of intermediary between the humans and the effects of their actions, there's this sort of accountability gap that gets created. A system could go and do some horrendous act, right, and like devastate a village and all the civilians in a village. And then we say, oh, is this a war crime? And under international law as it stands, you have to prove intention, which is usually the most difficult part of the war crimes tribunals, being able to actually demonstrate in court that a commander had the intention of committing, you know, some genocidal act or some war crime. And you can, you know, build various forms of evidence for that. Now, if you've sent out an autonomous system, and you may not even know what that system is really going to do. And you don't need to know exactly what it's going to do when you give its orders. It becomes very easy to sort of distance yourself legally from what that system does in the field. And maybe you suspect it might do something terrible and that's what you really want. But it would be very easy then to sort of cover up your true intentions using these kinds of systems. So on the one hand, it would be much easier to commit war crimes. On the other hand, it'll be much more difficult to prosecute or hold anybody accountable for war crimes that would be committed by autonomous weapons. You've also been producing some open letters this summer. There was one for academics calling on Google to stop work on Project Maven. And I'm sorry, you had another one. What was that one about? The Amazon face recognition. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what you see as the role of academics and corporations and civil society in general in this debate about lethal autonomous weapons. I think in terms of the debate of lethal autonomous weapons, the civil society has a crucial role to play, I, I think, in a broad range of humanitarian disarmament issues. 
And in the case of autonomous weapons, it's really it's a technology that's moving very quickly. And militaries are still a little bit unsure of exactly how they're going to use it, but they're very excited about it and they're putting lots of research investment into new applications and trying to find new ways of using it. And I think that's exciting from a research perspective, but it's very concerning from a, a humanitarian and human rights perspective because it's again it's not clear what what kind of legal accountability will be around these systems it's not clear what kind of safety uh, control and testing might be imposed on these systems and it also seems quite clear that these systems are ready made for arms races and global and regional military destabilizations right where competitors are acquiring these systems, and that has a potential to lead to conflict because of that destabilization itself. And then, of course, the rapid proliferation. So in terms of civil society's role, I think what we've been doing primarily is voicing the general concern. And I think uh, the broad public globally and within specific countries that we've surveyed are largely opposed to these systems. Of course, the proponents say that's just because they've seen too many sci-fi movies and these things are going to be just fine. But I don't think that's really the case. I think there's some genuine fears and concerns that need to be addressed. So we've also seen the involvement of a number of the tech companies that are developing artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, and things like that. And I think their interest and concern in this issue is is twofold. We have companies like ClearPath Robotics, which is the largest robotics company in Canada and also the largest supplier of robots to the Canadian military, whose engineers organized together to say that they do not want their systems to be used for autonomous weapons platforms. And they will not build them, but they also want to support the international campaign to ensure that governments don't acquire their robots and then weaponize them. And they're doing you know, search and rescue robots and bomb disposal robots. A similar movement amongst uh, academics and in artificial intelligence and robotics who have spent really their life work developing these fundamental technologies, who are then deeply concerned that the first, perhaps last application of this is going to be autonomous weapons. And that, you know, the public will turn against artificial intelligence and robotics because of that. And then that these systems are genuinely scary and that we shouldn't really be entrusting human lives or the decision to take human lives to these automated systems. They have all kinds of great practical social applications, and we should be pursuing those and just leave aside and really prohibit the use of, of these systems in the military context for autonomous targeting. And now I think we're seeing more movement from the big companies, particularly this open letter that we were part of with Google and their project Maven. And Project Maven is a Pentagon project that aims at analyzing uh, all the many thousands of hours of drone footage that the U.S. military drones are collecting over Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq and various places uh, where they're operating, and to try to automate using machine learning to identify objects of interest to kind of save time for human sensor analysts who have to pour through these images and then try to determine what that is. And in and of itself, that doesn't seem too terrible, right? You're just scanning through this imagery. But of course, this is really the first step to an automated targeted recognition system for drones. So if you wanted to fully automate drones, which currently require human operators to interpret the imagery, to decide you know, that this is something that should be targeted with a weapon and then to actually target and fire a weapon, that whole process is still controlled by humans. But if you wanted to automate it, the first thing you have to do is automate that visual analysis piece. And so Project Maven is trying to do exactly that and to do that on a really big scale. The other kind of issue from the perspective of kind of labor and research organization is that the Pentagon really has trouble, I think, attracting talent. There's you know, a really strong demand for artificial intelligence researchers and developers right now because there's so many applications and there's so much uh, business opportunity around it. It actually turns out the military opportunities are, are not nearly as lucrative as a lot of the other business applications. Google and Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft can offer enormous salaries to people with PhDs in machine learning or even just master's degrees or some experience in systems development. And the Pentagon can't compete with that on government salaries. And I think they're even having trouble getting you know, certain contracts with these companies. 
But when they get a contract with a company like Google, then they're able to get access to really the top talent in artificial intelligence and their cloud research groups and engineering. And um, also the sort of enormous capacity computationally of Google that has these massive data centers and processing capabilities. And then you're also getting, in some ways, I mean, Google is a company that collects data about people all over the world every day, all the time. Every Google search that you do, and there's millions of Google searches per second or something in the world, right? So they have also the potential of applying data that's collected from the public in all these complicated ways. It's really a kind of a unique company in in these respects. And I think as a company that collects that kind of private data, they also have a certain obligation to society to ensure that that data isn't used in detrimental ways. And siding with a single military in the world and using data that might be coming from users in countries where that military is operating. I think that's deeply problematic. And we, as academics, kind of lined up with the engineers and researchers at Google who were already protesting Google's involvement in this project. They were concerned about their involvement in the drone program. They were concerned about how this could be applied to autonomous weapon systems in the future. And they were just generally concerned with Google's attempt to become a major military contractor and not just, you know, selling uh, a simple service like a, a word processor or a search, which they do anyway, but actually developing customized systems to do military operations, analyze these, these systems and, and apply their engineering skills and resources to that. So we really joined together uh, as academics to support those workers. The workers have passed around an open letter, and and then uh, we passed around our letter. So the Google employees letter received over 4,000 signatures, and our letter from academics received almost 1,200 few shy. So we really got a, a lot of, I think, mobilization and awareness. And then Google agreed to not renew that contract. So they're not dropping it. They're going to continue it till the end of the year. But they've said that they will not renew it in the future. Is there anything else that you think is important to mention? I wrote a piece last night for a report on on human dignity. So I can just give you a little blurb on human dignity. So I think the other kind of interesting ethical question around autonomous systems is this question of the right to human dignity. And whether autonomous weapons or allowing robots to kill people would violate human dignity. And I think some people have a very simplistic notion of human dignity, that it's just some sort of aura or something of property that hangs around people and can be violated. But in fact, I I believe human dignity is a relation between people. And this is a more Kantian view that human dignity means that you're respected by others as a human. Others respect your rights, which doesn't mean they can never violate them, but they have to have reasons and justifications that are sound in order to override your rights. And in the case of human dignity, of course, you can die in many terrible ways on a battlefield. But the question is whether the decision to kill you is justified. And if it's not, then it's a sort of an arbitrary killing. And that means there's no reasons for it. And I think if you look at the writings of the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary and Arbitrary Executions, he's written some interesting papers on this, which is essentially that all killing by autonomous weapons would be arbitrary in this kind of legal sense, because these systems don't have access to reasons for killing you, to know that it's actually justified to use lethal force in a given situation. And that's because they're not reasoning in the same way that we are, but it's also because they're not human moral agents. And it's important in the sense that that they be human because it's human dignity is something that we all lose when it's violated. So if you look at slavery or you look at torture, it's not simply the person who's being tortured or enslaved who is suffering, though of course they are. But it's in fact all of us who lose a certain value of human life and human dignity by the very existence of slavery or torture and the acceptance of that. In a similar way, if we accept the killing of humans by machines, then we're really diminishing the nature of of human dignity and the value of human life in a broad sense that affects everybody. 
And I think that's that's really true. And I think we have to really think about what it means to have human control over these systems to ensure that uh, we're not violating the rights and dignity of people when we're engaged in armed conflict. Excellent. I think that was a nice addition. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. We covered a lot of ground in these interviews, and yet we still only scratched the surface of what's going on in the debate on lethal autonomous weapons. If you want to learn more, please visit autonomousweapons.org and visit the Research and Reports page. On the FLI site, we've also addressed some of the common arguments we hear in favor of lethal autonomous weapons, and we explain why we don't find those arguments convincing. If you want to learn even more, of course, there's the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots website, iCrack has a lot of useful information on their site, and Article 36 has good information, including their report on meaningful human control. And if you're also concerned about a future with lethal autonomous weapons, please take a moment to sign the pledge. You can find links to the pledge and everything else we've talked about on the FLI page for this podcast. I want to again thank Paul, Toby, Richard, Mary, Bonnie, and Peter for taking the time to talk about their work with lethal autonomous weapons. And if you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like it, share it, and maybe even give it a good review. I'll be back again at the end of next month discussing global AI policy. And don't forget that Lucas Perry also has a new podcast on AI value alignment, and a new episode from him will go live in the middle of the month.